I want to t start by talking about um, this very, I think, lovely front cover. I would say so myself, but um, OUP have generated this wonderful um, image. And a lot of people, when they see the front cover, they think, well, this is obviously going to be a polemic against Tony Blair. Uh, actually, it's not. Uh, it's really a book about ideas. And my main thing, really, is that the Iraq war is, is, is a very ideological adventure driven by ideas that are still with us and ideas that we're still uh, in the public domain long after the departure of people at the time, Tony Blair and, and all those people, uh, George Bush, Colin Powell, Jack Straw, uh, Claire Short, the whole cast of characters who you may recall, long after they've left the scene, are still the ideas of regime change, of rogue states, of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, revolutionary war, in fact, is still with us and we're still, that's still in the air. The front cover shows obviously a very Aztec, just in case you can't see it, a very Aztec-faced Tony Blair uh, at a uh, commemoration service in early 2017 for uh, all those who served in Afghanistan and Iraq. And actually what sort of drew me to that wasn't just his expression, but the, the faces of the giggling grandees and dignitaries and royals around him. That for whatever else you want to say about Tony Blair, and the book is critical about some of his judgments, he at least takes this very seriously and in a way he faces ahead, he faces the music. He actually comes and addresses this directly. He's ultimately unrepentant about his decision and his calculus about Iraq, but I, I, there is a certain ambivalence here about, well, I don't agree with him, but at least he's, he's articulating a case and a narrative. The reason I wrote this was precisely I was a bit scared that a lot of people would want to forget it or when they remember it to just trivialise it as Tony Blair's war. Tony Blair's, I won't use that expression in front of the uh, camera, Tony Blair's error and that it's something in the past, that it stands alone, we're beyond all that now, there's other things to worry about. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'll say this with my wife present, um, I, wrote, I started writing this while I was on honeymoon. Um, <laughs> um, and it just so happened that we were away at, uh, in a, on a Greek island the week after the uh, European referendum, because I'm sick of that B word, uh, and I was a little bit scared that I mean, the, the Chilcot report was about to be released afterwards, and I was concerned that Brexit would devour everything. It would overshadow everything, it would suck the energy out of everything else. It turns out I was more right than I knew. Uh, and I wanted to sort of try and push back a little bit against that and talk about the importance of the national and international reckoning with one of the most, the most significant uh, foreign policy uh, choice, I think, since Suez, at least in terms of military campaigns. Secondly, I was scared for another reason, that some others would want to remember it, um, particularly people who sort of weren't there, but want to remember it as a set of tactical lessons about how to do it right next time. So in other words, to almost trivialise the Iraq war as a kind of set, as a kind of um, uh, clinic in how to go around overthrowing regimes and, and democratising countries at the point of a gun and, and doing it better. And although that would also miss something about the profound nature of what was going on uh, in, what, in what, what was, uh, what I think, a blunder. Well, why do I say blunder? Um, a lot of people call it a crime. And that's that famous expression, I think, from the French, uh, it was worse than a crime, it was a blunder. But my, my thing is, even if let's say the whole thing had been certified as legal and the whole United Nations had agreed with it and the Pope and the Dalai Lama had signed off on it and the whole of Britain had voted for it in a referendum, I still think it would have been a mistake. I think there was something, there was a miscalculation about it. a blunder means a sort of careless error. But it's not just the way it's often talked about, that it's bad planning or bad technocratic thing. I think there's something about using war to overthrow governments that is inherently revolutionary and far wild, more wildly risky than we give credit for. Now, I'm no pacifist. I would prepare quite hawkish military capabilities, just not use them very much. I think beyond defence and deterrence, war is very hard to make work. And so I just want to just give you a brief summary of, of what I try and argue here, and that is that uh, the Iraq war is ultimately not a cynical exercise in, in doing something unspeakable while giving it nice sounding rhetoric. In fact, they meant it. And when I say they, it's not just Tony Blair. In fact, what I try and argue is that it's Britain's war, not just Blair's war. Multiple centres of decision sincerely believed that for a number of rationales, this was the right judgment call. And we've done similar things on a lesser scale again and again afterwards, after going after regime change in Damascus, Libya, and now in America, Venezuela. So this thing keeps going and going. Um, but it was the British Parliament, the Conservative Party, uh, 
Rupert Murdoch, the Sun King, who was not subject to Tony Blair's whip. Um, a large number of British people, when they were surveyed at the time from YouGov uh, over the first year of the war, quietly, quiet majorities actually supported it. They weren't the loud ones, but there was a quiet agreement and consent that this was probably the right move. A lot of Iraqis, particularly in exile, agreed with the war. In fact, Tony Blair, when he was campaigning, went to Edinburgh and a set of Iraqis who were representing the local community presented him with a letter demanding regime change and denouncing the anti-war protests, saying no, that a democratic revolution was possible in Iraq and desirable. And there was, in other words, there was a very broad ownership of this decision, which is being now, I think, rewritten and rewritten badly and irresponsibly and superficially as one man's obsession and one man's problem. And I think that is not only untrue, I think it's also very irresponsible. I think we have a responsibility to confront this issue because it's not just part of the past, it's part of the present. It's part of the, the debate we are still having about foreign policy. One of my students, in fact, di psychologically diagnosed me and accused me of this being really a book about Brexit. <laughs> I really hope not. Um, that might just hurt the sales or help the sales, who knows. Uh, it's not that, but I do... One thing I am sort of concerned about in the air at the moment, um, if there's one little parallel I would, I would want to draw, not so much about the rights or wrongs of decision, but about the kind of atmosphere in which decisions are made. One thing you hear a lot, and we all say it, is we're sick of this thing. Put it to bed, get on with it. There was quite a lot of that around the whole question of, of disarmament and Iraq and Saddam Hussein and the end game. And as well as it being about a matter of, of, of fear, post 9-11 world, fear of terrorism, fear of WMD, fear of rogue states bringing those things together, and as much as it was all about a sense of power, because if you look at the arc of history from the end of the Cold War to 2003, an increasing optimism that war can work, and not just war to defend yourself or, or to deter attacks, but actually to go around and reordering whole regions. But also, as well as, well as all that, there was this real strong sense that we're just sick of this misbehaving rogue maverick in Baghdad. And Donald Rumsfeld, often after 9-11, writes, sweep it all up, sweep, get rid of it, like it's a mosquito. So there is a kind of dangerousness to that boredom and that fatigue, which I've sort of noticed in the, in the country at the moment. That's enough Brexit for now. <laughs> another, there's another aspect of which, which is, I think, distinctively British, uh, and that is a third part, uh, as well as the sense of the dangerous rogue state, as well as the sense in which the path to security is to overthrow states, the third part was what we might call the blood price, the idea that Britain can secure special influence in Washington by bandwagoning or aligning itself with this American campaign. And that's actually quite an old idea in British statecraft, all the way back at least to the days of Harold Macmillan and the end of World War II, that Britain may no longer be a first-tier superpower, but it still has imperial knowledge. It still has expertise in power projection, in rail politic, in running the world, and that it can advise and tutor the new superpower, America, and Bush's America, and Bush's America inflamed and wounded and terrified by 9-11 that might go off the rails and start nuking people or take itself out of the international system or junk the United Nations. And the first reaction of the Blair government and many people after 9-11 is to be scared of America. And this belief that by, by joining in and by getting America to sign up to an international process of arms control and verification and inspection and escalation with Iraq, that at least Britain could tie America back in to the international system. Um, it, I say quite aside from that, there is a quite sincere fear about WMD, and I'd say a little bit more about that at the moment, but there's a bigger agenda which is quite explicit, which is this is about Britain's, not just its specialness, but its ability to steer this very powerful and potentially dangerous United States in the right direction. There is a certain condescension implicit in that. I'm not sure that your Harvard-educated PhD expert with three languages really does need Harf Harvey Wilkinson from the FCA to tell him exactly what to do. But there was an authentic and quite responsible idea that what does this mean for the international system and Britain trying to craft a responsible way through that. In fact, as you can probably hear from the tone of my voice, the, the biggest criticism I get about this book is that I'm too nice, <laughs> in a way, to the people making these decisions. But I think if you're going to try and write a history of something, you have to try a little bit of empathy and imagine for just an afternoon that you might be wrong. So the way the whole book ends is that I, I show Tony Blair's speech on the eve of the war and then I try and write an alternative speech <laughs> he could have given if, if we, we weren't going in. 
and so that people can judge for themselves. Because if we're going to say that the whole thing is dogmatic, then we have to avoid our own dogmas and entertain the argument once again, because it's an argument we keep having. Um, last thing I'll say, because what's often mentioned as well is what about the dossiers, what about the lies, what about the 45 minutes and all of that stuff. I think it's much worse in a way than people wanting to do something wicked and so therefore fabricating excuses. In a way that would be better because there's a certain control and a certain realism in that. What you have here rather is people deciding that they want to do this very ambitious thing and there's a real ambition here in the, in the White House and in London to reshape the Middle East as a, path, as a pathway through Baghdad to a better and safer world. But there is um, minds already made up before assessing evidence, right? So it's self-delusion rather than just deluding others. And in the, in the process of dealing with intelligence, which is ambiguous, and can be interpreted in different ways, and in many respects weak and patchy, they've already made up their minds, and so they're, they're placing unwarranted certitude on ambiguous evidence. But even if they'd realised and come face to face with the ambiguity of the evidence, they still believed it was the right thing to do, because we didn't know, because Saddam Hussein had played cat and mouse. And there was a second logic, which was, we can't take risks in the post 9-11 world, we have to get in first. There's a very brutal logic here, we've got to get them first. Tragically, what that does, of course, is to ignore the wild risks of, of breaking a state. And that's what we're talking about here, that after 9-11, Britain and America led an international coalition, including Australia, which was doing something they weren't realising they were doing, which was acting as Jacobins, which is radical revolutionary war, uh, overthrowing regimes to reshape uh, regions, to liberate them, and, and to do so to, for the net benefit of humanity. Um, so it was much worse than a cynical exercise. Uh, it was a war of real idealism. And um, unfortunately, it's, that's not part of our past, but that's an argument we need to have with ourselves rather than just saying rude things about Tony Blair and cheering waiters as they try and arrest him in restaurants. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers.